hello everyone. It's uh, great to see you again for uh, Physics Meets ML for what uh, for us in Boston is the first Physics Meets ML of the new academic year, which is fun. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Sam Schoenholz from Google Research, the brain team here to tell us about Jack's MD. Uh, Sam and I actually were PhD students in physics at the same time at Penn and uh, were uh, uh, friends in graduate school doing rather different types of physics. And then I uh, we sort of lost touch for a few years and I realized he's doing all this fantastic ML work at Google that uh, is just great stuff. And uh, we're gonna hear about applications to molecular dynamics today. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to have him here. And Sam, good to see you again. We're really looking forward to your talk and feel free everyone to ask Sam questions throughout. There'll be a couple natural places for pauses and uh, we can go from there, so thanks. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. And it's also great to see you. It's been, it's, it's been like, I think like six or seven years at this point. So it, it's awesome. It's awesome to be here. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk uh, today about some work we've been doing, I guess, over the past like two years or so now, um, developing this, this software library called JAXMD, um, which is a, a framework for differentiable molecular dynamics. Um, and this work is really in collaboration um, with my friend Dosh uh, at, at Google, but also a kind of growing list of open source contributors um, who've been really like adding some nice features that are, are both in the library now and will continue to be added um, in the near future. Um, so, you know, I, I, I guess like just at a high level, um, molecular dynamics is sort of a cornerstone, I think at this point, of physics research, at least in, in you know, condensed matter or material science. Um, and, and the idea is basically that you simulate a system of atoms or constituent particles. Um, and if your interactions, and you specify some interactions, and if the interactions have like high enough fidelity to nature, then you can sort of study these simulations instead of studying um, uh, experimental systems, and this this can be nice because you have like access to the full state of the system. You can run lots of experiments in parallel, and you can run experiments that maybe you wouldn't be able to do in a lab. Uh, so this is an example of like silicon dioxide glass, or so, like glass that you'd see in like a window um, at room temperature. Um, when we think about sort of traditional molecular dynamics libraries, um, and and I you know part of this project is like looking at molecular dynamics but another part of it is that like that is a, a style of simulation that i'm familiar with so i think some of these takeaways probably hold for a lot of different kinds of uh physical simulations um but anyway you you traditionally have like a very fast back end um that's written in either c and or cuda if you want to run on gpu um and this is great because the code is really really fast and i think that one thing about traditional MD libraries is that they they are very performant and the people who wrote them are like really good at writing performant code. Um, but but this leads to like significant code duplication because you need to have like multiple code paths between the C part of the library and the CUDA part of the library. Um, and you as a user don't really interact with this like low level code. What you do is you write simulations uh, in some front end language. So this can be Python or it can be like LAMP script if you're using this, this MD package called LAMPS. Um, and this is, you know, it has an advantage. This is advantageous because you don't have to like deal with this like low level code, but it's, it, it you know, is, has some negatives too because it's pretty easy to follow up usability cliffs. So like if I want to do something that's a little bit outside of the way, uh, uh, you know, outside of the intended use case for the simulation, I really can't do very much about it unless I'm willing to dive into this like low level code, which again has all this code duplication between C and CUDA. Um, and, and so, you know, this is especially bad because, or, or can be especially problematic because, you know, one of the ways that you get really fast code is by handing off large chunks of the simulation to the C library. So you're not going back and forth to Python. You're really being like, I want to run my simulation for like a thousand steps or 10,000 steps. Um, and then you get back a state when you're done. Finally, all the derivatives are handwritten. Um, and you know, I just think this is like laborious and error prone at this point. Um, and I think together, this means that like, if I'm a graduate student um, or a researcher, and I sort of want to try out a kind of new idea that's a little bit off the beaten path, it can take months. Um, and I think that this is like an especially bad fit 
for the intersection of machine learning and physics. Um, because we have like these complicated derivatives, oftentimes our simulations are pretty um, unique and different. Um, and so there have been a lot of like kind of heroic attempts to implement or to integrate machine learning models with existing uh, libraries. And I think, you know, they've been successful to some degree, but I think it's interesting to consider what else we could do. Um, so what we wanted to do here was consider, take inspiration from machine learning uh, and in particular kind of like two different branches of machine learning or, or two different things, uh, drivers of machine learning that I think have really, um, really like allowed ML to flourish and have been responsible for a lot of the great progress we've seen over the last couple of years um, or a decade or two. And I guess the two that I, I have in mind are automatic differentiation and just-in-time compilation. Um, so, so to that end, we wanted to, we, we tried writing this, this MD library, kind of like taking those two things as given. And we had sort of some high level features in mind um, that we've sort of like um, tried to hit. Uh, first, we wanted it to be easy to express complicated simulations um, that were like kind of unique. And so this means that, you know, some, some implications of this is that simulation code is written in the same language as experiments. So everything's in Python. Um, and we also tried to write it um, sort of like in a functional, more like data-driven approach where like you have these components that are sort of like loosely connected primitives that you can compose to build simulations. So if I want to build a simulation, I don't have to start from scratch. We give you sort of like useful building blocks um, that you can use to assemble things. Um, we wanted it to be fast enough to do high quality research. So I think it won't be as fast as the bespoke uh, libraries, um, but we sort of do two things here. One is that we use this great new technology by uh, Google called XLA to just in time compile our simulations um, to whatever backend you want. So it can be like CPU, GPU, or TPU. And we have also implemented a bunch of, um, or several classical, what are called spatial partitioning strategies, because you normally have like, when I have a system of atoms, each atom doesn't need to talk to or look at the position of every other atom. It usually just needs to look in a local neighborhood. And this lets you get away with order n rather than order n squared scaling. And finally, we wanted machine learning to be a first class citizen. And this sort of means two things. Uh, first, it means that any function uh, can be a neural network. Um, so if I want an energy to be approximated by a neural network, that's fine. Um, but also we want like whole simulations to be end to end differentiable. And I think this like opens the door to some interesting uh, meta learning um, or meta optimization approaches that can be applied now to uh, to physical systems. So, for example, if I wanted to optimize like the temperature trajectory uh, or cooling schedule for a material to like minimize the number of defects, that should be something that you can do in a differentiable way. So, as I said, I, I think there are some limitations of the approach that we've taken. Um, it's slower uh, than specialized software. And performance is inconsistent across backends. Um, usually, if you're on GPU, you get something like a 2.5x slowdown compared to like kind of the, the custom solutions. And we're missing some simulation environments. Uh, in particular, we're currently lacking uh, long range interactions and internal degrees of freedom. I would also add to this list, I guess, um, that you know, one of the things we've observed is that there is some friction from the functional approach. I think it has a lot of advantages, but I think there are some aspects of the design that like don't quite mesh and create some tension. And so uh, thinking about nice ways of handling those is, a, is, is kind of an ongoing area of work. So, you know, the JAX and JAXMD, you may have heard of, it's a new um, machine learning library, or I guess I, I just think of it as like a numerical computing library with automatic differentiation support. Uh, if you've heard of Autograd out of Harvard, it's the spiritual successor to Autograd. And it's basically NumPy on GPU with, compo with composable function transformations, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, but so if you know NumPy, it, it has like exactly a one-to-one -one, um, API with NumPy. So, so you kind of already know JAX if you know NumPy. Um, and it, it's functional. So, so everything is immutable um, and first order functions or, or higher order functions are everywhere. Um, so like I said, there are these composable function transformations, uh, grad, JIT, and VMAP. Um, and the idea is that rather than having some like gradient tape that you have to like keep track of, um, the way JAX works is uh, you have these function transformations that take a function and return a new function. So if I have this function f of x, where f of x takes the dot product of x in itself, so this is like the L2 norm, um, if I write df equals grad of f, 
df is now a new function that computes its gradient. And so if I had some input x that was like a vector zero, 1, 0, 2, um, then if I print out f of x, I get 5. If I print out df of x, I get the gradient, which is like 2, 0, 4. Um, there's JIT, which is how you compile things to device. And again, same principle. It takes a function in and returns a new function that's like the compiled version of that function. So if I have a function f of x, again, let's say I wanted to compute twice the norm, but like I was doing it in kind of a silly way where I took the dot product of x in itself and then I added the dot product of x in itself. If I run the function f of x, this will be executed as like three different GPU calls. So this is sort of like eager execution in PyTorch. So it'll go in, it'll run the first dot product, then the second dot product, and then add the result. But if I JIT f, this will get compiled to a single call. And actually, one of the nice things is that XLA, which is what's kind of doing the heavy lifting in this JIT compilation, is does optimization for you. So it would notice that there were two copies of this dot product, and it would like fuse them into like two times dot x in, in itself. So, so, so JIT not only executes in a single call, but it also does optimization, whole like whole program optimization. So usually it's a way to get significant speed ups. Uh, finally, VMAP, which I think is like actually my favorite function transformation, um, takes a function uh, and uh, and outputs a new function that computes that function over like a whole batch of data. Um, and this is great because like GPUs and TPUs are designed to exploit parallelism. And, and um, that's how you get like, you're able to efficiently use compute. But it's often kind of hard to think about like, how would I write this function as like acting on a whole set of inputs at once? Um, and this is, I'll show some examples of this later, but, but this can be especially complicated if like the thing you're trying to VMAP is like a whole simulation. Um, and, and so what this does is, is it takes a function, let's say, again, we're going to look at our L2 norm, this dot product. And, and now let's say I wanted to compute the norm of two vectors at once. So I, I define my X, um, and now it's, it has two vectors, this 1, 0, 1, and this 1, 2, 0. Um, and if I VMAP F and apply it to X, I get two different, the norms of the two vectors. Um, but it's important to note that, like, this was not computed in serial, so it didn't, like, do a loop over the two inputs. It actually computed the whole thing in a single parallel call. OK. Um, but actually, so, so uh, yeah, totally. one quick question. So what if you, you don't have enough GPU memory? Then what happens to the EMAP? Yeah, so, so you can definitely get yourself into trouble running out of GPU memory. Um, so often what you'll do is you can split it into like a serial for loop and a VMAP. Um, so you, you still need to like have a for loop sometimes to like operate batch by batch. Um, it's just that what VMAP lets you do is it lets you write code that's not batched and then do the batching automatically, um, which can be a lot simpler. But yeah, you can still totally run out of memory. I okay. actually think um, there's a function that they're working on, although, you know, I don't, you know, I haven't looked into it too closely called XMAP. Uh, and I think XMAP lets you do like a partitioning where you do like part of it in serial and part of it in parallel. Um, but but yeah, that's, that's a good question. Cool, thanks. No problem. Yeah, so um, I wanna just very briefly give, go over like the overall design of, of JaxMD before um, diving in. Um, like I said, we, we tried to make it very modular and have these like kind of components that are loosely connected, um, but can be composed. Um, and one of the things that we like about this approach is that this means that like, if you're doing something that's not exactly an MD simulation, but you still wanna use some of the tools, it's very easy to do so. So like, for example, um, if, you know, if you wanna operate on like a point cloud data set, some of these tools might still be useful, even if you're not doing like molecular dynamics. Um, so anyway, at the start of every simulation is a notion of space. So this is like, what space are my points living in? Um, and this will usually be like Euclidean space. It might be like periodic boundary conditions, which like associates the two edges um, and so, or the edges of the space. And so that would be like equivalent to like a torus. Um, but so basically spaces give you two things. They give you a notion of distance or a displacement. So you can compute displacement between points. 
and it gives you um, a way of moving points on the space, so transporting points. Um, we then, like I said, have these spatial partitioning algorithms that like take points in space and partition them into local neighborhoods. Um, we have some vectorization utilities that like take functions that act on one instance of a thing and promote them to one that acts on like a whole system of points uh, or a whole system. Um, you, and these are usually like wrappers around VMAP. Um, and then we have a bunch of neural network primitives that you can use in your simulations. Uh, on top of like all of this are a bunch of different energy functions um, that you know are we've included a bunch of common energy functions, some neural network energy functions, um, and these basically compute like the the potential energy of the system. Um, and then using those energy functions, you can define uh, optimizers to like find ground states or, or inherent structures. You can um, have simulations to simulate the system in various um, ensembles. So you can do like simulations at constant temperature, or you can do simulations at constant energy. Uh, so we have a number of different common simulation environments. And then finally, we have some tools to do analysis. Um, okay, so so with that, I, I'd really like to actually spend most of the talk time um, doing it, going through a demo. Um, I kind of think it's the best way to um, to show some of this stuff. Uh, so this is where the, I don't know if, let me know if the um, the video stops sharing because sometimes it does at this point. Um, but okay, so I'm gonna go through this demo. Yep. Yeah, I don't, I don't see it anymore, I see a black screen. Okay, great, thank you. I just think I need to uh, stop sharing and then start sharing again. I don't know why it does this, but it's okay. All right, is that better? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna go through a demo um, showing a bunch of different features. Um, this, this whole thing is online. So if you go into JaxMD and then go to notebooks and then go to talk demo, it's all there. So don't worry about like following everything. This is just supposed to give like an overview and feel free to like go through it uh, if you're interested at your own pace. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to simulate a system. Um, and this system is gonna be composed of these things called soft spheres. And what that means is that when the two, um, it's gonna be composed of these like spheres. And when they overlap, they're gonna repel each other softly. Um, and when they don't overlap, they won't interact at all. And the way we're gonna model that is by this interaction energy where if two particles are overlapping, so if the distance between them is less than one, the energy grows as one minus R cubed. So it's gonna grow kind of like smoothly from zero. So if R is one, this is zero. And if R is zero, this is one third. So it goes from like zero up to a third. Um, and if we wanted to define this in, um, in, in code, we would write soft sphere and it would be a function of distance and we'd say, where r is less than one, one third r, one minus r cubed, otherwise zero. So it you know, looks a lot like the math and we can print out the value at some point. Uh, and if we want, we can plot it um, at a bunch of different points. So here, this lin space just produces a bunch of points between zero and two. We can see that the potential goes to zero at one. Okay, we can also though, you know, we're, we have automatic differentiation. So we can compute the gradient. Um, and so we can just use this grad to get du dr, which is gonna be the gradient of soft sphere, and we can give it um, some distance. Now, let's say you know we have this set of Rs, which is like the set of all the points. And let's say I tried to compute, I wanted to compute the gradient at all the different points simultaneously. Um, R, R. So if I want to compute the distance at all the, or the gradient or, or the derivative at all the different points simultaneously, it'll give an error. It'll say the gradient is only defined for scale, scalar output functions. And this is because in, in JAX, the gradient is only defined for functions that are from you know, whatever space, so r to the n to r. But, the, but this implicitly, when we give it a, a vector instead of a scalar, is a function from rn to rn. So if we want to compute the derivative over many radii, we have to vectorize the function. 
So we have to use VMAP to say, we're going to be computing this over many, over many values simultaneously. And now, um, and now we can compute the derivative at all the different points at once. So this is like an example of using VMAP that I think is already kind of interesting because we're VMapping code that we didn't write. We're like VMapping code that was generated by the gradient function. So this lets us compute the derivative at all the different at all of these points simultaneously. And if you if you're you know if you're used to machine learning examples, I think you know one pain point that comes up a lot is like per example gradients. And so this is an example of us doing per example gradients using VMAP. Okay, so we have this energy function. We've looked at its derivative. Um, so now let's actually like create a system of particles. And so what we're going to do is we're going to define some globals that are going to define our simulation. So we have some particle count, which is going to be 128. Um, and we have some spatial dimension, which is two. Um, and then we're just going to compute. Um, this is like a little utility function so that we can create a system at a density instead of giving a size. So this is just going to tell us how big our system is. Um, and then we're going to randomly uh, generate um, positions uniformly inside that, um, that, that box size. And then we can draw the system. So this is what our initial configuration looks like. Um, and so now, um, you know, we might want to, so, so we have this like collection of particles and they're living in, in you know, the space between zero and box size. Um, so we're going to use what's called periodic boundary conditions, which means that particles can kind of loop around the sides of the box. Um, and so, you know, I mentioned that in JAXMD, the, the primitive, the main primitive or the, the, the lowest level of primitive is the notion of a space. So, and, and there are two things, there's a displacement function and a shift function. So we're going to make the space and to do that, we call space.periodic with the box size. And that gives us these two functions, displacement and shift. And the displacement function, you give two positions. So we'll give it the first and second atom or particle, and it will return the displacement vector between them. And we can also use this to define a metric. Um, so we do space.metric, and that takes this displacement function and it returns a new function that computes the distance between two points. Um, however, you know, we probably don't want to be computing distances between only two points at once. We probably want to compute distances between like all the points in the system. So we have this little utility wrapper around VMAP called map product. And so we're going to apply it to our displacement on our metric. And now we can give the metric a set of three points and it will compute the distances between all pairs. So here the distance between on the diagonal is zero because the distance between every atom in itself or particle in itself is zero. And the off diagonals um, get the distance between those pairs. So, this lets us are, so are you on the torus right now? Or yeah, is because this periodic? Is the so the exactly. displacement and the metric are both accounting for the, the torus uh, mm -hmm. topology? Exactly. Cool. Nice. And if you wanted to not account for the, the torus, you could use space.free. But one mm. thing I'll emphasize, and, and I think it's something that I like about this whole approach, is that if I, for example, wanted to do a simulation on like the surface of a sphere, for example, if I can write down the metric then and, and a function that does transport, then all the other stuff in the pipeline of simulation will like just work. Um, and this is very at odds with how normal simulation environments work, where you have like a notion of a system and it's like rigidly encoded what the space is. And I think this is like one of the advantages of the functional approach. So if you can define a metric, um, you don't need to write down any derivatives or anything. Uh, you'll be able to do simulations on that, on that manifold. Um, but yeah, great question. Okay, so so now let's say we want you know we calc we had this energy function our soft sphere function and we wanted to calculate um, you know the energy we, we were calculating the energy at like one distance but now we want to calculate the energy of the whole system um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to write down dr we're going to have a, a function energy that's going to take an r which is the position of all the atoms we're going to compute all the distances and then we're going to take the sum 
of all the pairwise terms. So every, every pair of distances will get one contribution to the energy. And so we can compute the energy of the system and we can compute the gradient of the energy. And so this is giving us some energy and this is giving us the direction that all the atoms and particles would move to, to lower their energy. Um, yeah, if there are any questions here, I think this is like a very reasonable place to take, take a few. Um, if not, that's totally fine and I can just keep going, but I'll wait like and take one sip of coffee. All right, so um, now what we want to do is we want to take this like random configuration of points and we want to find a minimum energy um, configuration. So we want to we want to minimize the energy. And um, all the simulation environments in JAXMD work in exactly the same way. So what you do is you have some simulation environment. So here we're going to do what's called fire descent, which is just some minimizer, minimization algorithm. And we give it the energy that it needs to minimize. And we give it the shift because it needs to know how to transport points. So it needs to know the energy and it needs to know how to transport points um, to minimize the energy. And it returns two things. It returns an initialization function, which initializes the state of the system. And it returns an apply function, which takes a single step of dynamics. So if we wanted to run this simulation, we would write state equals init fun of R. So this is initializing the state. And then what we're going to do is while the max force, so you know, state has this thing called force. So we're going to say, while the maximum force is more than 10 to the minus three, update the state. And while we're doing it, we're just going to keep track of the positions after every step. And so we've minimized the system. And so one thing we can do is JAXMD, we, we've written this renderer to try to, to like, so that you can like visualize things in Colab. And so here's what the minimization looks like. And you know, it's, it's interactive, we can move around. Um, and, and, um, and, and we can also, um, yeah. And so for future, for, fu for, for the next step, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just define this helper function, which is the, you know, if I looked at this while loop, we were doing, we were, we were looping until the max force was less than 10 to the minus three. Um, and so we're just gonna define a con this thing called confun, which is just gonna take the state and return whether or not the max force was less than 10 to the minus three. Okay, so this, this simulation works and it minimizes the state, um, but it's a little bit slow. And the reason why is because we haven't jit anything yet. So this is actually going, this, this, whole optim, this whole minimization routine was going through and every operator was being executed as a separate call to, um, to the CPU or to the GPU. Um, so let's do better. Let's try to figure out how to make it fast using JIT. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define a function called minimize. And what minimize is going to do is it's going to do the three steps that we wrote down above. So first, it's going to create the minimizer. Then it's going to initialize the state of the minimizer. And then it's we're, right now, we're just going to apply 20 steps of optimization. So we'll apply 20 steps of optimization. And then we're just going to return the final energy after 20 steps. And so we can time this. So in, in JAX, um, you know, one of the things they do, this is like a technical note, but they, they, they do what's called async dispatch, which means they execute commands um, before the next command is ready. And this is something they do to make the not just in time compiled execution faster. Um, so we need this block until ready, just says wait until the calculation is done. So this is with no just in time compilation. And it takes about a second to do 20 steps of optimization. So now we're going to just in time compile it. So we, from JAX, we import this JIT function. Um, and then we're going to say minimize is JIT minimize. So now minimize is compiled. Or this annotates minimize to say we want to compile it. And so the first time we run minimize, it will actually do the compilation. And we don't, wanna, we don't really want to time that. But one thing I want to point out is that it's a little bit slow. And we'll get to that in a second. So that, that compilation took a little bit of time. Um, but now if I run, um, if I time the minimize function, we see that it's 
like 3.6 milliseconds per loop. Um, so, you know, we've gained maybe a factor of like 30 or so. Um, or more. Um, we've gained, so, 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 uh, like a lot more. Sorry. Anyway, um, math is hard. Uh, so, anyway, the difference between not JIT and JIT compilation is huge, but the time to compile was kind of long. And the reason why this time to compile was kind of long is because this for loop here, and the reason why we only are doing 20 steps of, of optimization is because this for loop um, is what's called unrolled. So when Jax is trying to compile it, the program that Jax sees to compile it doesn't have the for loop in it. It just has every step of the for loop kind of like unrolled in one big program. So that takes a little while to compile. So to make compilation faster, um, what we're going to do is we're going to slightly change how we write our minimization. Um, and so first, we're going to say uh, we're still going to initialize the, the minimizer. But then we're going to use this thing called while loop, which is an intrinsic while loop. So that means it gets compiled as a loop onto the GPU. And we have to give it the conditional, which is, again, this cond fund we just defined, which is has the max force, is the max force larger than 10 to the minus three? It takes the apply function to take one step of dynamics, and then it takes the initial state. Um, so we're going to just in time compile it, and then we're going to run it once. And you see that was fast. So that, that was the whole minimization um, and compilation. And then we can time the whole thing. And we see that the, the total time, so this isn't the time for 20 steps anymore. This is the time for like a total minimization has gone down to 26 milliseconds. Um, so this gives us both fast runtime and fast compilation if we use this sort of like while loop construction. OK, so, so, so this I have is a question. Uh, totally. So what if you what if you only get the the whatever's inside the loop like each step but you keep the loop? Yeah. So that would definitely be fast. That would be somewhere in between. Um, so I mean, we could even try it. Uh, so like I, I'm just wondering how much overhead is the for loop versus like what's interior in the, in every step. That's a very good question. Um, you know what? We we could even we could even just try it. Let's see. Um, so if we wanted to do that, we could just say, So what we would do is we would actually, I don't want to do it this way because we don't want to time the JIT cost of the apply function. So I'm just going to say apply fun equals JIT apply fun, and let's let's take a look. So so this is this is uh, compiling the, the the apply function, but not the loop. Time it. And we'll probably have to wait for, so this was 218 milliseconds. But this is also not exactly fair. Um, so one problem is that like, so this term here that we're like, where we um, have this while loop. So this term here requires synchronization with the GPU. So, so I think it would, if we had like a for loop here, like let's say like, for in range like 100 or something, I bet this would be a lot faster um, because it could do things asynchronously. Yeah, so that that's a lot closer. I don't know exactly how many steps this is running, um, but but it, so it kind of depends a lot on the on the like when Jax can like speculatively or not even speculatively when Jax can Jax can run ahead of the GPU, um, so it doesn't need to synchronize. Uh, it's not that big a difference, but when you force synchronization points, it can be quite large. That's, that's a great question. That's cool. Thanks. Okay. Um, 
So, so you know, we, we've run a simulation. We've seen kind of like how to make it go fast. Um, and now I want to go through an example that I think sort of like demonstrates how to, um, or some of the advantages of using Autodiff. Because I think we've seen a little bit, but I think there's some more. So, um, so, you know, one of the things that people like computing for atomistic systems is what are called the elastic moduli. And they basically measure if I take my simulation, you know, my simulation is in a box. What happens if I slightly deform the box? So what if I were to like um, make the box a little bit smaller, like how much energy would that cost? Um, and th that's what's called like, for example, the bulk modulus. Um, so there are these, these moduli that say, if I were to deform the simulation cell, how much, how much energy would that cost? And, and that's useful, for example, um, if you want to do things like um, measure for like some metal, how much, uh, like how bendable is it? This is something that like often is controlled by the elastic moduli, at least when you bend it a little bit. So um, what we're gonna do to, to measure that is we are going to take a system and do exactly like I said, we're gonna deform it in some way. And to do that, we're gonna use this thing called uh, so, so, so the, when I, you know, previously we were using this thing called space.periodic. Um, periodic general is a more general boundary condition. And it says not only are the sides associated of this box, but the box doesn't have to be a box. It can be any parallel pipe. In. So it can be any kind of like deformed box. Um, and so, and, and this, this fractional coordinate annotation is not particularly important. It just says, we're going to measure our positions in, in real space rather than like in the unit cube. Um, and that, that doesn't make too much difference. Um, and then we want to compute the, you know, so, so, so we've recreated our displacement function, which means we need to recreate the energy function as well. Um, but instead of using the um, energy function we wrote above, we're gonna use a, a, a helper function we have in JAXMD called soft sphere pair. Uh, and it's the same function as the one I wrote above, um, but, uh, and, and alpha equals three is just annotating that we want to use that like cubed power instead of a different power. Um, so this gives us the same kind of energy function. We give it the displacement and we can compute the soft sphere function um, for some positions. Um, so now we want to again measure how much energy does it cost if I were to deform the system. And so what we're going to do is we're going to write down what's called strain energy and it's going to be a function that computes the soft sphere energy of the positions given. But then we're going to say new box. So we're going to like deform the box is going to be whatever box size we have times some strain. So strain is going to be how much we're do how much we're deforming. And we want to measure deformation about the undeformed box. So we're going to give it the identity. So identity says we're not deforming the box at all, but then we want to compute how much would the energy change if we deformed it just a bit. And so to do that, we're going to use, we want to, we want to compute the Hessian. So Jax, you know, not only does first order automatic differentiation, but it also does higher order automatic differentiation. So we can import this Hessian function and it works kind of in exactly the same way. This Hessian of strain energy is a new function that computes the Hessian. And we're going to compute the Hessian about um, the identity matrix. So we're going to give it the identity, which says no deformation. And then we're going to give it the inherent structure or the minimized configuration that we saw above. And we can look at the shape. And this is a two by two by two by two tensor. So um, it, it gives you every combination of possible strains. Um, and then we have a helper function bulk modulus. Uh, so you can be like, I want to know how much Bulk modulus is like, how much does the energy change if I compress the system slightly? So if I made it a little bit smaller, how much does the energy change? And so this computes the bulk modulus. Um, but, you know, we might not want to compute the bulk modulus like just at one system size. Like usually maybe you want to look at like how the bulk modulus changes as I compress the system. So to do that, we're going to write this function called elastic moduli. And this is going to put together a bunch of different pieces that we've already seen. So it's going to be a function of two different things. It's going to be a function of the number density. 
So how, how, what's the density of the system? And then it's going to be a function of the random, a random seed or a random key. And what we're going to do is first, we're going to compute the box size. Then we're going to randomly initialize the part the positions of the particles inside that box. Then we're going to create the space in which the particles live. And we're going to create the soft sphere energy. So this is like basically just copy pasting everything that we've already written. And then we're going to do a minimization. So this is the same, you know, we, we are redefining this fire descent and now we're using this general shift instead of the periodic shift, but it, it you know, the, the descent algorithm actually doesn't care. Um, we initialize the state and then we do a while loop to minimize. And then we actually compute the bulk modulus. So we have this strain energy, which applies some small infinitesimal strain to the box and we compute the Hessian and then we compute the, the, the bulk modulus. So altogether, um, th this function will compute one elastic modulus. So if I were to say, I want to say elastic modulus, moduli, and I'm going to give it, um, I guess it should just be called bulk modulus or something. But anyway, I'll give it a number density of one, say, and a random key. And this will return the bulk modulus. And this should be the same as what we found above. OK. Um, but let's say we didn't want to just compute the bulk modulus at one density. Let's say we wanted to compute it at a bunch of different densities. So here we can use VMAP. Um, we, yeah, sorry. Oh, anyway. Um, so we can write elastic moduli equals VMAP of elastic moduli. And we can specify what dimension, what axis we want to take the vectorize over. So here, we don't want to vectorize over the random seed. We just want to vectorize over the um, the, elast the, 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 uh, the number density. So we want to do different compressions. And so then we're going to do a number of different, 40 different number densities between 1 and 1 1.6. We're going to compute the bulk modulus, and then we're going to plot it. And so this calculation was done in parallel over all the different elastic moduli at once. And kind of if you think about it a little bit, there's like a lot going on here, right? Like we're initializing the system, we're running the minimization, we're initializing the minimization, we're running the minimization, we're computing the elastic, we're computing the Hessian. And and but you know, we were able to do it super fast because we're vectorizing the whole calculation. Um, and you would never want to vectorize this by hand. So this is one of the reasons why I find uh, VMAP so cool. Now let's say we wanted to, you know, this was one sample. So this was one, one system. But let's say we wanted to compute the bulk modulus for like a bunch of different systems at once. Um, so we can actually vectorize again. You can, one of the nice things about having everything be functional is I can, you know, elastic moduli is still a function. It was a function before the VMAP. It's a function after the VMAP. So I can apply VMAP again. And so here, instead of vectorizing over the um, number densities, I'm going to vectorize over the random keys. Um, and then we're going to run it again. And then we're going to loop over the different members of the ensemble um, and plot uh, the, the different bulk moduli. OK, and so this is now all the different number densities and 10 seeds per, per bulk modulus, again, all being computed in like one pass um, on the GPU. So you know there are lots of different ways that you can saturate GPU performance. You can make a really large system, or you can um, do ensembling. And I think JAX makes it just like super trivial to uh, aggregate statistics. Um, OK, so, so, so you know, like I said, there are kind of two ways to saturate GPU memory. Um, you can aggregate statistics, or you can make a large system. So, so far, we've been doing a pretty small system. We've only had 128 particles. Um, but I mentioned that you know, we've written JAXMD to scale um, to large, pretty large systems. So let's do it. Um, so we're going to do 128,000 particles. And again, we're going to 
figure out what the box size should be at the same number density. So the density is going to be one. We're going to randomly initialize the points. Um, and then we're going to create the space. So the periodic boundary conditions. And so um, this is what the system looks like before any optimization. Um, it's like, you know, somewhat, somewhat big. Um, but, you know, what we want to do is, you know, one of the things that like I mentioned is we have these like spatial partitioning strategies that let us, instead of considering like all dis distances, we can only consider like neighboring distances because we know that if two of these particles aren't overlapping, um, they don't, you know, they don't have any interaction. So what we're going to do is we're going to use something called neighbor lists, which builds a list of neighbors. Um, and so we're going to use the saw sphere neighbor list command uh, in Jackson D. And again, it takes a displacement and then it also takes a uh, box size, the size of the simulation environment. Um, and then we're just going to create the, the minimizer as we did exactly before. So this is like the same fire descent minimizer. It's none the wiser that we've sort of subbed in this different energy function. Um, and then, but the, this, this software neighbor list actually returns two things. It returns a function to compute neighborhoods and it returns a function to compute energies. Um, and so we can use the neighbor, the neighbors lit function, give it the positions, and then we can, um, this gives us a list of neighbors. And if we do neighbors.idx.shape, that's like 128,000 particles with 20 neighbors per particle. Um, and so then we're just going to do optimization. Um, so we're going to initialize the, the minimizer. And now we pass this keyword argument, neighbors, which hints to the minimization algorithm that it needs to, um, that, that there are neighbors. And so we're going to say, give it the positions and the neighbors. And then again, we have this um, condition function, which says, has any force been larger than 10 to the minus three. And we have a step function, which now we need to do two steps and things in our step function. First, we update the neighbor list or the list of neighbors. And then we take one step of optimization. But other than that, it's exactly the same as what we had before. And so here we're like kind of composing two operations. We're composing neighbor list construction with a simulation step. And so we can have our while loop with our conditional and our step and we give it the state, the initial state and the neighbor list. And then it um, outputs the uh, new state and the final neighbor list. And so we see that like we've minimized the system. It's all like minimized. Um, and so, yeah, so you, you can scale with this. Um, and one of the things to note that I just want to point out is that, um, you know, here we write neighbors equals neighbor fun of uh, state dot position and neighbors. And that one of the things about XLA is that like inside a just in time compiled function, all the shapes need to be like statically known. And this lets it do efficient uh, memory layout. And so here, um, we're not allowed to change the max number of neighbors. Um, and so one thing you can do is we can look at the neighbor list after the simulation and we can ask, did, did buffer overflow, which asks at any point during the simulation, was there not enough room in the neighbor list? Um, and if there were, we could reallocate the neighbor list if we wanted to. And so this would like create a new neighbor list um, and here we see that in the minimized configuration, there are actually only eight neighbors. And so if we wanted to do simulation, uh, it might be worthwhile to, uh, to lower the number of neighbors. Okay, so I'm just gonna um, go through, I guess, one more quick example, um, because I think it's kind of neat, uh, hopefully in like four minutes, and then um, maybe just uh, take some questions. Uh, so, so, you know, as, as I said, we wanted machine learning to sort of like be a first class citizen. Um, and this means using neural networks uh, anywhere. Um, and so I preloaded some data from uh, something called density functional theory, which is a quantum mechanical solver. Um, 
and, and, uh, and so this is a 64 atom silicon system that was computed using DFT. And so we have some positions, we have some energies and we have some forces. Um, and we can look at like the mean and the standard deviation of the, and the histogram of the, of the energies. Um, and I, I know for a fact that this system was created with a box size of 10.862. So we can create our periodic boundary conditions. Um, but now we're going to use a graph network um, as an energy function. So we're going to say like from JAXMD import graph network, and then you know neural network potentials, unlike other potentials, do two again return kind of two functions. They return an initialization function, which initializes the parameters of the model, and then the energy function, which actually does the computation. So here we would give the parameters, we would initialize the parameters, and then compute the energy. And if we wanted to, we could compute the energy over like, we have these test positions, we could compute the energy over like all the test positions with VMAP. So let's vectorize the energy function, not over the parameters, only over the positions and compute the, um, the energies over the whole thing. And so this is a randomly initialized graph network. And I think one of the things that's kind of funny actually is that like what we're plotting here is we're plotting on the X axis, the ground truth energies and on the y-axis we're plotting the predicted energies from the random graph network and i think it's kind of funny that there's actually a pretty strong negative correlation so there's some inductive bias that graph networks have that's like well suited for these problems um which is funny um so anyway if we wanted to train this model um you know we could write a little training loop uh, and i don't want to go into this in too much detail because i'm kind of running out of time um but there's a function that uh is basically the L2 loss on the energy. And then a function that's like the L2 loss on the forces. So the forces we write as the gradient of the energy over the positions. So this argnums equals one says we're taking the gradient with respect to the positions. Um, and then our total loss is gonna be the sum of the energy contribution and the force contribution. Um, and then we're gonna optimize. So we're gonna use this library called Optax, uh, which uh, is in the JAX ecosystem. And it uses, again, very similar API to our simulations. So we're going to use an atom optimizer with global gradient norm uh, clipping. We're going to initialize the optimizer. Um, and then we are going to have an update function, which takes a single step of gradient descent. Um, and so we can run a couple steps. And you can see like the first step is sort of like compiling. And once it's compiled, it runs pretty fast. And so we can see that like now the predicted energies are a lot better than they were before, or at least they're going in the right direction. Um, but what I'll do is I'll load a pre-trained model that I trained earlier for a lot longer. And then what we're going to do is we're going to, um, so this loads parameters from a file, and then we're going to bake those parameters into the energy model by partial evaluation. Um, and then we can again plot the predicted energies against the test energies. And we see that you know this, this pre-trained model is actually pretty good. Um, and we can look at the forces compared with the ground truth forces. And we see we actually get pretty good force prediction as well. Um, and we can use this in a simulation. And this is kind of where I wanted to get to. So, um, we can run a constant temperature simulation and we just give it the neural network energy function as though it were any other energy function. Again, init initialization function and apply function. Um, and we initialize the state of the simulation. Uh, we're going to run a simulation at 300 degrees Kelvin. Um, and then we're just going to take, um, you know, some steps of gradient descent. And we see again, it like took a few seconds to initialize or to JIT, but now we're running. What's the uh, advantage of using progress editor instead of TQDM? Oh, like none. Uh, All right. this is just what I used. I, 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 I have no, 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 no stake or preference. 
right. Uh, I I actually would probably use TQDM uh, if I were writing the code now. Cool. Um, but yeah, so so then we can plot uh, the temperature as a function of time, um, and we get you know we can see that it's equilibrating at like three hundred degrees, and we can like render um, the simulation. So this is like this neural network potential trained on uh, DFT data running um, without without having to modify any code any, any code, which is which is the goal. Okay, great. Um, so, so there, there were, you know, maybe a few more things, uh, but, but I want to, in the interest of time, kind of just like very, very briefly, in like the last minute or two, highlight. Oh, uh, this is supposed to skip. Anyway, uh, I want to highlight two, two examples that have been used in research, which I kind of liked. Um, one was this paper by uh, Carl Goodrich and Alec Kang, um, and they differentiated through whole simulation trajectories to do optimization of um, yields in, 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 in like uh, dynamics. So for example, if you have a cluster of, of um, six particles, uh, those particles will naturally form polytetrahedra um, if they all have symmetric interactions. And, um, and what they wanted to do was they wanted to use gradient descent and tune the interactions um, among other things so to, to favor the octahedron instead. And so like, as they ran, so on the right-hand side, you see a plot of like the interactions between all the different particles. And what happens is at some point, the system starts learning that there's like a symmetry breaking transition where four of the particles end up having a strong negative interaction. And then the rest have a pretty strong positive interaction. And this is actually like a known result. So, so using gradient descent without you know, knowing any physics, we were able to sort of reproduce this known known result. Um, and then finally, uh, there's this paper, Learned Optimization on Rough Landscapes, where we combined neural networks or like learn this like idea of learned optimizers. So optimizers that are being trained on data um, to try to find good low energy configurations of atomistic systems. Um, and so uh, here we see a bunch of different compositions for a model that wasn't trained on, on, um, on these elements. And we see the ESMC lines, so the blue and the orange line, are, um, are different learned optimizers. And this is like the minimum energy configuration that they were able to find. Um, and then blue, purple, and, and brown. Purple is like if you use the same number of steps for what's called basin hopping, which is like the best or a very good or, um, way of finding low energy configurations. Um, and then brown is if you're able to use 10 times the number of steps as the learned optimizer. And so what we see is that like the learned optimizers are able to get maybe like a 10x step advantage in terms of finding low energy configurations for these systems. But anyway, thanks. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Sam, thanks for the wonderful talk. That was great. Uh, this is an awesome graphic here, by the way, at the end. I've seen this somewhere else and uh, just, just very fun. Did you make that or did someone else? Yeah, yeah, we made this. So this is um, this is a simulation of, I think it's like 84,000 rigid. So one of the things we're adding, but it's not out yet, is adding support for like rigid bodies. So what we did is we took a picture of the JAX logo um, and we discretized it into 84,000 rigid cubes. So each rigid yeah. cube is four particles. So it's like 300,000 or so particles. Um, and then, yeah, we, we smashed a, a ball into it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it's a great demonstration for people that want to see quickly, uh, you know, the sorts of things that you guys can, can do. That's just, just fun. Very neat. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, more, more serious question while other questions are coming in. I'm sure there's many. many. First of all, I want to say bravo on the real-time demo. I think that is the first extended real-time demo we've had at Physics Meets ML. And uh, at least for me, it was hugely instructive. Um, my question is whether on this learning, uh, I think, did you call it learning to optimize at the end? If you could just mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about the workflow and um, 
you know, there, there are many places throughout physics, including in string theory, where we, where we might want to learn to do such a thing. How is it that you think about a, a given problem in that context, and why was it the right it, the right thing to do for your guys' problem? Yeah. So, so you know, I, to be honest, like I, I don't think yet it's been like demonstrated that it is like the right approach, um, yeah. because you know, I, I think um, I, I think that you know, we it, the problems we applied it to were still somewhat toy. Um, I guess, I guess like, so, so what we, I mean, I guess there were two parts of the question, maybe like what we, like the workflow, um, and then like, um, maybe like why we did it. Was that, is that like a fair characterization? Um, yeah. and so I, the workflow is sort of like, you know, we, so I guess there's like this pretty large and growing, um, set of learned optimizer papers. Um, so, you know, we, we used something called uh, CMAES, which is like this ev called evolutionary strategies. And so what you do is you run a whole bunch of simulations. This actually didn't involve uh, gradients through simulations. So you run a whole bunch of different simulations. And so this is like um, the simulations involved, uh, you know, having an optimizer, which gets access to a bunch of different features. Uh, it, it gets like the particle positions and part of the, you know, the work that went into this was feature engineering and figuring out what the right features are. But it got like the particle positions, the forces on the particles, the um, the time step, the energy, um, among others. And, uh, and, and then it predicts like a new output position. Um, and you run a lot of these different uh, forward simulations, uh, varying the parameters in a ball. So you like for each simulation, you you randomly initialize the parameters about a fixed parameter, um, yeah. and this gives you sort of like an an estimate of the gradient, uh, and then you take a step. Um, and one of the reasons why we were curious to see whether this approach worked for these systems um, was that, you know, like I said, learned optimizers have been getting big in machine learning, but most machine learning problems, you know, aren't very non-convex. Um, and also there's this like question of, do you even want to be minimizing the training loss? And so, so in learned optimizers, they often like, aren't even minimizing the training loss. They're trying to like minimize some downstream loss. Um, but in these sort of like clusters, we know that we want to be minimizing the, the, the energy. Um, and we know that they're highly non-convex. So one of the things that we were able to do was like vary the non-convexity of the problem and sort of see that the learned optimizers were like nonetheless able to to find ground states or like low energy configurations. Um, so it was kind of like a way of validating sort of both sides. I see. And, and the differentiability is is uh, I, I guess an asset in these because you were also I think you mentioned you you were talking about evolutionary optimizers uh, a second ago and you weren't you weren't differentiating through the optimization. Yeah, so in that case, we weren't. Um, so in, in the first case, this was differentiating through whole simulation to do the optimization and using gradient-based optimization. This did not use gradient-based optimization. It still used the differentiability because the features that were, there were a lot of like differentiable features that were given to the, the optimizer. And it was also sort of essential that we like be able to have both things kind of like in the same workflow. Um, so, so I would say like, sometimes it's the differentiability or like the end to end differentiability, but sometimes it's just like being able to have all the neural network primitives in the same, uh, like environment as all of the like physics primitives. Mm -hmm. That's, that's cool. Thank you. That, that gives me something to think about. We, uh, poten potentially useful for some problems that I, that I think about. Wonderful talk. I'm sure there's other questions. So I'll let other people ask them. Um, are there questions for Sam? There are questions in the chat. Ah. I can take a look at the chat. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I ask a quick question? Uh, yeah, hey, how's it going? Yo, it's also been like six years since we uh, last saw each other. Oh, I know. <laughs> uh, we actually are, like, we meet on regular. Uh, but um, so, so based on what you show, it seems like uh, it's also possible to like, suppose you want to tune hyperparameters on like a small near network or something. Mm -hmm. you, like you could actually tune like, you know, four networks at the same time by jit, by jitting the whole thing. Oh, right? totally. Yeah, 
absolutely. I, I actually think like, um, I think that's like a super awesome use case for like, so like, I guess maybe what you're asking is like, you know, a, a really nice workflow, right? Would be like VMAP, the training loop um, over hyperparameters um, and do to, or oversee it mm -hmm. if you wanted to get mm -hmm. better statistics. Um, so, and, and especially if you were, you know, doing something like taking small networks that you wanted to eventually scale up using yeah. say some parameterization. Um, yeah, I think that would be a very good workflow. Yes. Right. Like, and that would improve the GPU utilization a lot, presumably. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so, um, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if it's worth doing. I can bring up a plot at least for the physical systems, but basically what we see is that if you have a relatively small system, let's say I have like 32 or 64 atoms and it depends on the size, it depends on the GPUs, type of GPU, but we basically see perfect scaling with number of members of the ensemble up to a point where you saturate um, and, then, and then it flattens out. Um, Nice. So yeah, I think I think you can get virtu virtually perfect uh, scaling. Nice. And and by That's the great. way, um, one other thing just to point out is that um, you know in, in these systems, I mean, um, Jax also has like other primitives. So they have like this PMAP, which is like parallelization over devices. Um, and when you parallelize over devices. Uh, you know, so so if you, let's say you were doing a neural network training, which works nicely on TPU, you could use all eight cores of the TPU and vectorize over each core of the TPU separately, um, and just mm -hmm. like get tons of statistics. I see. Well, uh, just very quickly, a slightly different question, but like, uh, is there like a PMAP before like a uh, model parallelism? Like, so you yes, have to do like all, all gather or something. Okay, yeah. that's cool. So there's, that's cool. They, they do both model and data parallelism. Nice. Um, it's called PJIT is model parallelism, PMAP is data parallelism, and then there's something called XMAP, which does both. Nice. Cool. Sounds nice. Awesome. Uh, okay, so... Um, Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go through. So uh, to Marcel's question, which is out of curiosity in JAX, does a call to f of x and then d f of x execute the forward pass twice? Does this get jitted away if combined? I think if you jit both, like one after the other, um, so the, the function that you were jitting was like, you know, compute the energy and then compute the, the gradient, um, they, would, they would be combined. I think XLA will almost surely always do that optimization. I think um, one thing um, is, I guess one thing is that um, Jax also has a function called value and grad, which does explicitly mer uh, fuses the two operations. Um, but, but I think it will do the optimization anyway. Um, Peter asks, uh, how does the auto diff handle neighbor, the neighbor function? That's a good question. I mean, like naively, right? Like neighbor lists are uh, non-differentiable. Um, so I think basically what will happen is, you know, there will be zero grad through the neighbor list. So if you had a potential that was, or a, a function that was not like C1 or like whatever order derivative that you were taking continuous, um, in principle, having neighbors changing would discontinuously change the derivative. Um, and so that would be problematic. I think the, the thing that you need to do is to ensure that whatever function you're computing over the neighbors, um, has enough smoothness properties that changes to the neighborhood doesn't, wouldn't change the function output. Um, I guess, I guess both Marcel and Peter, is that like, does that kind of get at, uh, the answers to your question? I, I, you can say something or like thumbs up just before I go on. I will assume yes, <laughs> but if not, 
feel free to pick. Yeah, I just wanted to, yeah, th thanks for the talk. Yeah, I, I guess I just wanted to uh, understand how is actually Jack's handling it underneath? Like how, how is it being implemented, I guess? Oh, okay, so how, so I guess there's like a question of like, so first of all, um, the rule of thumb in Jax is that any function you can write in terms of numpy primitives, you can like take derivatives through. Um, and so the trick uh, when we wrote the neighborless code was just to figure out how to write efficient neighborless code with numpy primitives. Um, and you know, I, I can talk a little bit about how we do it, um, but basically we do like what's you know called like a locally sensitive hash. So we we hash based on the positions, um, and then we look in adjacent buckets of the hash by position, and look at all pairs in that those adjacent buckets that have small distance or distance less than the cutoff. Um, and you know when you have a less than function, um, which is obviously not continuous or um, you know has is not, you know, it, it doesn't have a derivative. What will happen is that Jax will just have the derivative through that B0. So, so what will happen is, um, you know, the, the neighborless function takes positions which are continuous, but outputs a discrete set of labels, which are the IDs of the neighborhoods. And so the derivative through that will just be zero because the, the IDs aren't differentiable. So it'll treat, it'll basically treat it as like a zero grad through the neighborless calculation and then just calculate the derivative through the um, through the energy part of the calculation uh, using fixed neighborhoods, basically. Does that does that help? Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. Yeah, uh, I guess it's just interesting. Do you have to do some sort of check to make sure whatever it's whenever it's doing something like that 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 what what you get is what you get makes sense, uh, or is it this kind of the standard case that this is the most natural way to handle something like this? Yeah, so I think, like I said, I think the main thing to be aware of is that, like, let's say I'm calculating an energy. You want to make sure that, like, right, like, you, you define a neighborhood, and you want to make sure that, um, that at the cutoff distance, the gradient of the function is zero, so that it smoothly increases. And so then I think there's no problem with the neighborhood changing. Okay, yeah, but that I, makes sense, yeah. So I think, I think that's like a property of the energy, not a property of the gradient through the neighbor list. Okay, uh, Antonia asks how easy it is to put in different network potentials like Schnet or any 2x. Um, we actually had someone uh, go through a pass of implementing Annie, and it's it's in a uh, a PR. Um, you know, I think it's as hard as it is to implement in like you know approximately as hard as, as it is to implement in like PyTorch. Um, so, and often you can you know do a translation. What I'm kind of secretly hoping is that like you know as Jax has become more popular there are more and more potential uh, neural network potentials that are just in Jax. And I think one thing is that like once it's, once you've implemented the network in Jax, um, you can use it in any simulation environment. So as long as you have a function that like goes from positions to an energy or positions and neighbor list to an energy, either way, um, you don't need to do any, the whole point, like one of the things that we really wanted to get to is the, to the point where like, you don't need at that point to do any other work. So I think like, there's no effort at all to once you have the neural network implemented in JAX um, to use that in a simulation. There is some effort probably in like implementing those networks in the first place. One thing that we haven't looked at, but I think would be interesting to look at is, um, Jax supports something called zero cost um, device transfer, like or uh, memory trans sharing with PyTorch. So I think in principle you could even use like a PyTorch network, maybe. But I, I, there are some reasons why I think that wouldn't necessarily work quite quite right. Um, but we could maybe work on it anyway. I think so. I think the, the the basic my basic answer though is that like 
no no effort uh, to to integrate into simulations, and then like it, it's just about implementing the neural network. Um, and and you can implement it in what like there are a bunch now of Jax neural network libraries. There's like Flax, there's Haiku, there's something called like uh, Treaks, which is a new one. Anyway, you can use any of them. Like Jax is totally agnostic as long as you give it a function um, that takes positions uh, to an energy, it will happily use it in in a simulation. Um, I don't. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you. Can I ask a very quick follow up to that? Yeah, of course. Um, so do you do any sort of, I guess you're mostly implementing the framework, so you don't necessarily benchmark um, how these different potentials work other than, I don't know, a single point energies and maybe some forces like you showed in your demo. Um, is there any kind of idea of like, as a community, do we know which um, potentials we should use, which ones we shouldn't use? Um, are there any efforts made in that direction, I guess? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think that's a great question. I, I, I mean, to be completely honest, I think that we've actually been hoping as much as possible to like sort of not be in the game of implementing the networks inside JaxMD, because I think that like it's better, it's, it's kind of a bit better, like there are a lot of people who are implementing these neural network potentials and it's a bit better for us to remain sort of agnostic rather than trying to have like a version of each neural network potential in, in JaxMD. We'd like to instead be like, make it as easy as possible for any neural network potential used in written in Jax to, to be used. Um, having said that, I mean, I think there are some very nice papers um, that have gotten into what neural network potentials to use. Um, I mean, I, I know I know that's something Marcel Who's, who's in the meeting has been working on. Um, another thing that I'd like to sh just kind of shout out because I think it's timely um, is there's this also also this like Sci ML um, meeting and I, I can try to post a link later, but uh, someone is giving a talk tomorrow there um, on something called the Nequip potential, um, which I haven't used personally, but at least like as an onlooker seems like a very interesting family of um, of models, and so, um, so so I think like there, but there are some fundamental questions. Like for example, most you know, I think I think some questions that I would just say are worth weighing are like, do you need a graph network, or can you get away with kernel methods? And I think that's an interesting question. And then there's another question, which is how important is symmetry um, in designing a potential? So for example, the Nequip potential, um, and there's one by Max Welling's group called like the SE3 or the E3 equivariant neural network, um, both work hard to build in the notion of equivariance to all the spatial symmetries, so like to translation, to, to rotation um, and to permutation invariance. Um, and I think there's like a question of like, um, how important is that in practice? Um, I think it's interesting. It kind of depends who you ask. Um, I feel like this is the kind of thing where like this will end up being sorted out, um, but I don't know if there's like a a, a prescription a prescription uh, that I could give. Um, cool, but thank you very much. It was a great talk. <laughs> thanks. Um, so then Juan asks, um, are you planning on implementing techniques for handling long range interactions like multi-level summation or particle mesh well sums? And the answer is yes. Um, it's uh, so we have been like playing around with uh, Ewald and particle mesh Ewald sums. Um, I don't have an ETA for when they would be implemented, um, but yes, we are, we are working on it. Um, I, think they, we will have them, I don't want to give an ETA, but yes, I, I, they are, we will definitely at least have uh, particle mesh, Ewald and Ewald sums. Thank you. No, no problem, thanks. Great Q&A session, lots of interested people. Are there any last questions for Sam? Yeah, like kind of a different question. Uh, so like, 
But we had um, Jesse talk about uh, you know ODE sometimes back, and he was like saying you know he would rather use Ju Julia than Jax and Pytorch in that order. So I don't know if you if you thought about Julia. I I don't I have no skin in that game. I just like hear about Julia all the time. So I just wonder, you know, what is what is your professional opinion? If if you would like to be on the record. <laughs> um I, I, I'm happy to be on the record. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm gonna give a very satisfying answer. Um I personally have like played with Julia for like an hour at some point, and I really don't think I've given it enough effort to um to to give an intelligent opinion. Um everything that I've heard about it sounds really nice. Um, I, I, I think it, you know, I personally am a big fan of compiled of statically compiled languages and I'm a big fan of statically typed languages. Um, so, so I think there's a lot of stuff to like about Julia. Um, I guess sort of at a very, again, and I say this having not really worked too much with Julia. So like, you know, someone who is a Julia expert might be like, oh, this is like, you know, you're totally wrong. And I'd be like, yeah, I, I probably am totally wrong. Um, but the way I, I sort of see it um, at a high level is maybe like there's a continuum of like low level control versus sort of like high level ease of use. Um, and there's some performance trade-off on that curve. And it seems to me that um, Julia is like somewhere between like C, which you probably wouldn't want to use for this, and Python is on another level. Um, and so it kind of depends where you want to sit. I think, you know, for better or for worse, um, right now, the machine learning ecosystem is very much in Python. And so I think it's nonetheless useful to have a molecular dynamics library in Python natively. Um, if you know tides change and machine learning people end up switching to Julia, then and I, I think by the way I've looked around and I think there seem to be very nice MD libraries already in Julia. So so yeah. So I think I think both are good. I think any kind of like the more we explore the design space, the better. Um, I don't. I, I think it's strictly a uh, like a you know. Um, I think having like a non-competitive, like plenty mindset is better and cooperative mindset is better than like zero mm -hmm. sum. I, I don't think it's zero sum. I think it's like- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Learned. for sure. And my impression from Jesse is that Julia has much better support for numerical integration. Whereas I guess Jax is differentiation. It's like opposite side of the same point in some sense, but uh, I guess for ODE stuff, you care about integration probably more. Yeah, I mean, I guess one thing that I would, would just say is like, you know, I, I think it's probably what people have spent more time on, right? Like JAX is still pretty new. I don't think, I mean, I, there's been a little bit of work on ODEs, um, but I don't think like a serious ODE person has been like, I'm gonna write a really good ODE library in JAX. Um, mm. Whereas, you know, I think Julia, has a lot of like people from like the MIT Harvard sphere working in it. And I imagine, and have been for a very long time, like, you know, Julia is a much more mature project. Um, and right. so I imagine like, you know, it's it, a lot of its ecosystem, right? Like Jax yeah. probably has better ecosystem for neural networks. Julia probably has a better ecosystem for scientific computing. If more machine learning people work in Julia, the Julia ML ecosystem will get better. If more scientific computing people work in Jax, the Jax, scientific computing ecosystem will get better. So, uh, yep. But yeah, I, I, to be fair, I really want to try out Julia at some point. Um, yeah. I, I, it's on my list of things to do that I just like have never had time for. Yeah. All right, Julian asks, uh, I have a Jax newbie question. You mentioned that uh, in case you run out of GPU memory, the behavior can be a hybrid. Um, no, it requires, uh, it doesn't require, does this auto happen automatically or does it require a manual approach? Um, you know, right now it requires, um, it's, it's manual. So, so what we usually do is we just have like a Python for loop at the outside and then like whatever the VMAP function is on the inside. Um, and, and, and that, you know, typically works pretty, pretty well. 
Um, I do know that uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to like promise anything, but I do know that like they, like I, I mentioned a bit ago, they've been playing around with this like X map transform, which I haven't really used very much. Um, but I think the purpose, I think one of the things that you can do with X map is you can do, um, so there are three transforms. I guess there are four transforms really. There's map, there's vmap, there's pmap, and there's pjit. And so map is like a serial map, um, which, which just does a loop. vmap is like a vectorized, a vectorization over um, single device. pmap is vectorization over multiple devices in a data parallel way. And pjit is vectorization over multiple devices in a model parallel way, which basically means that like you can take your system or your image or have a, a neural network that operates on patches of the image and it knows how to do communication so that you can have like large images spread over multiple cores. Um, so they're trying to work on this thing called XMAP, which will unify all of those four things. Um, and I would um, could imagine a, a, in the future having, and I think one of the things about XMAP is you can like implement your own strategy. So I could imagine in, in the future being able to do something automatic with XMAP here. But I personally um, don't know. Uh, I haven't really used it. And for us so far, like doing it manually has not uh, been a deal breaker. Um, another Jax newbie question. Does Jax support or aim to solve support solvers for constrained optimization problems? Um, that is a very good question. I'm probably not the person to ask. So I guess at a high level, one thing I would say, and I think this also speaks to maybe Greg's question about ODE solvers. Um, you know, Jax is really, one of the things that I really like about Jax uh, is that Jax is just aiming to be a low level numerical computing, scientific computing library. And they don't have very much support for like neural networks natively. They don't have very much support for um, for like ODE solvers natively or or or, or et cetera. Um, however, different people are building libraries on top of JAX um, that do support various things. So one thing I would say is that I don't think JAX aims to, aims to support solvers really, aside, outside of like maybe what's in SciP. Um, and they do have some root binding. Um, but there are algorithm, or, um, libraries, such as there's this one called JAXOPT um, recently, um, which do aim to support better optimization. So I would say like um, JAX probably is not the right place to look, but I think there are libraries in the JAX ecosystem um, that are would be like a reasonable place um, to kind of look look for this. Uh, so so there's like this, I guess, is one one place that I would I would I would kind of take a look. Um, and there might be others. I think you know the pros and cons of having sort of like uh, an ecosystem that is uh, that is rapidly growing but not terribly organized. All right. Wow, that was a 30 minute q and that, That's approaching the, our, our physics meets ML record, I think. Are there any last questions for Sam? I mean, I'm sure we can keep going for one or two more, but uh, it's also been half an hour beyond, so. Okay, one more, I guess. Uh, oh, thank you. Okay, just a small follow-up. Does a for loop with a map allow differentiation? Um, yes, so just to be clear, um, you can differentiate through loops, you can differentiate through anything kind of any any function. You can differentiate through any function as long as all of the primitive operations are numpy oper or are JAX operations. So so you can have a map with a for loop in it and differentiate through that just fine. Um, I I mean yeah uh, t totally, absolutely. So so I had this function. Um, earlier that I showed where we had this like minimize function that like took the 
you know, initialized the system uh, or took a set of initial positions and like uh, ran some minimization on it, you could differentiate through that whole minimization algorithm. Um, totally. Maybe then I'll ask a, 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 a final question, Sam, and then we'll let you go. I mean, this is sort of related to the Jack's, Jack's newbie stuff. I've, I've coded a little bit and some of my friends have. Um, my, my impression from being new to it is that in terms of auto diff and you know, differentiating through loops and stuff like this, not only is it um, minimal compared to some of the other libraries in the sense that it's just numpy, but also some of the auto diff features just seem like next level stuff. Is that is that right? I don't know all the libraries that are out there, but it seems like things are automatic in Jax that just aren't otherwise. Yeah, I think I got I think that that's like really where it shines. Like I think that's like the expertise of the people who made it. Like Matt, um, Roy, and Dougal are all like absolute pros. Um, so yeah, I think I think the automatic differentiation is the best um, of any of any library. Um, I think that. It is this way for several reasons. I, th I think the aesthetic of having a function, the functional approach of, of functions that return functions yeah. just lends itself very well to automatic differentiation. Like you can compose gradient with Hessian. Um, they have forward and reverse automatic differentiation, which other libraries uh, I think really don't, um, or at least it's hard, it's like hard to coerce it to do, to do so. Um, the automatic vectorization um, lets you do per example gradients much more easily than you could otherwise. They have very good support for custom derivatives in both forward and reverse mode. Um, they have, you know, again, like this composable function transformation thing is just very powerful. Like I think, for example, um, they have a function transformation for like gradient rematerialization. Um, where if you have like a very long loop, for example, rematerialization will decompose it into smaller chunks so that the memory utilization is lower. So you can get like log n, uh, where n is the number of steps memory consumption for a gradient rather than order n um, with like log n extra um, recomputation. So yeah, I, I personally think that it is, it is significantly better than other libraries, at least as far as I'm aware. Um, awesome. Well, maybe that's uh, motivation for all of us to get using it more and more. So, all right. Well, I do I, think, I, oh, 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 go on, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I do think, you know, one of the things, I, I mean, I think I've presented like a very like uh, flowery view of Jax, and for the most part, I do really, really like it. I think there are places where, um, you know, it, it there are like certain places of where it's like there's tension and like or like things you'll hit that are like oh that's kind of annoying um so you know i don't think it's perfect like i think like for example sometimes like you know i personally wouldn't program in an object oriented style in jacks i know people do it i pers personally wouldn't um and i do know that some people it takes a little while to get the hang of um of the immutability and it takes a little while to get a hang, the hang of um, when is something actually getting recompiled? When is there accidentally like a large constant that I've folded into my calculation because it's sort of like in the closure of a function. So there, there are some things, but overall, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it's, it, it's great. Well, that's great. Um, well, thank you again for the talk. It was great to see you again. I'm gonna go ahead and yeah. stop recording and um, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me.